Okay, there we go. Welcome, welcome very much to Conversation. Great pleasure, personal pleasure, for me to welcome now for the third time in the recent experience, uh, Dr. Lawrence Finer. He's a PhD uh, in mathematics. Mathematics. At mathematics, I believe at um, MIT. At MIT. And he's also got a book that we've let people know about that apparently I'm happy to say he's doing very well. His title, I can read it here, The Reagan Revolution and the Developing Countries, 1980-90, to 90, A Seminal Decade for Predicting the World Economic Future, which I understand from him the book is doing well, for doing which well, I'm glad. It's very well written, and it's, very, uh, it's a very important work that you've done, and uh, he's got a partner that we're looking forward to talking with who might be in New York in the time ahead. But Lawrence, once again, welcome very, welcome, very much you. to Conversation. Okay, first of all, some odds and heads about the Cambridge Forecast Group. That's the oh, firm that yeah. I'm the principal in. Right, okay. First of all, our blog is called the Cambridge Forecast Group Blog. To get there, you go to www.cambridgeforecast.wordpress.com, mm -hmm. or you can go to Google, uh -huh. put in Cambridge Forecast Group blog, and uh -huh. you'll be right there. Okay. The and how long has it been going? It's been going for three years. Okay. It gets uh -huh. about 1,000 hits a day. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. It has literally hundreds of topics, among them Islamic finance, Bernanke speeches, BIS reports, Greek financial crisis, and Brazil. Uh huh. Okay, it also has links to the two um, appearances I did here. Okay, Links good. to my video on the fall of communism and its impact on race relationships, and also a, a book by, St by Seslo Milos. Uh -huh. Cecil Millish on essays and letters from occupied Poland, 1942 to 1943. Yeah, I have a feeling I know that name, but I maybe Millish. Yes, I, yeah, I, I don't know. My yeah, partner yeah. put it up on the blog. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Also, just as an aside, my partner did a very impressive job programming the blog. Uh -huh. He doesn't have a computer background. I guess he has a real patience uh -huh. to go through it, learn the CMS. And, What's CMS? Uh, I don't know what it stands for exactly, okay. but it's CMS. It's an operating system. The way in which you can operate. Which you can machine. operate the blog. He uh, could have just gotten a seven-year-old. They would yeah, have done yeah, a form seven -year -old without it. Which is very encouraging. The kids yeah. pick it up. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so what was I going to say? Hmm. Uh, yeah, he has graphics and he has hmm. he has animation. He has a spinning globe there. Uh huh. Uh huh. Anyway, uh, and it's also, called again. What's it? Uh, the, the Cambridge blog. Forecast Group blog. Now, that, how long have you two been doing that? How long has that? He, been no, together? he's been doing it for three years. No, not the blog, but the Cambridge. Pro okay. Oh, since 1979, we've been. 79. Doing it. That goes way back. That goes way that back. Goes, uh, Reagan's just coming into office. Reagan. Well, yeah. no, it was coming. He came in in 1981. Yeah, yeah, it came in. in uh, was, but but anyway, it was the age of Reagan. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Uh, we, in, in the spring of 1981, we got another subscriber. We had one subscriber, which was Chase International. Uh -huh. but we got another subscriber to the Cambridge Forecast. And you were report. doing, you were, you, it was a financial-oriented uh, look at yeah, the finan yeah, financial, world financial, financial order. future. Uh, and, and what's your partner's area of expertise? You're mathematics. He was, he was an uh, expert in Asian regional economics. Okay. And you were also, uh, you, too, you work in, uh, in mathematics, but you were also interested in finance or in, in economic forecast. Economic, economic forecasting. forecasting. Okay, and anyway, in, in the spring of 81, we got a, the, one of our subscribers was the National Security Council, the Reagan National Security Council. Holy Toledo. And one of the fellows on the planning and evaluation staff wrote Richard a nice letter. Dear Richard, I have just finished reading the latest issue of Cambridge Forecast Reports, and I compliment, compliment you on it. The analysis, as always, was uncommonly incisive. I share the reports of my colleagues on the NSC staff. We value your, your thoughts. Looking forward to your next issue. I remain sincerely Douglas J. Fife. Now, I don't know if you've Douglas, heard of Douglas Of course I've heard, heard of Douglas, Douglas Fife. Fife. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. the, the brains behind the yeah. uh, Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Right. He right. and Richard Pearl sabotaged arms control right. during right. the 80s. Uh, uh -huh. And he was also one of the brains behind the second Gulf War. Uh -huh. And we didn't agree with him at all. I, I used to go and do programs, Lawrence, as you say, uh, in, in the early 70s. I was down in Washington with the big old deck we'd go down and yeah, do yeah, it. Right. And the, the neocons, you know. Well, the uh, neocons, uh, yeah. Paul Wolfowitz. And so Paul Wolfowitz. Were there, but they were thought of really as the lunatic fringe. As the lunatic fringe, right. They right, really right. were. They were just yeah. thought just as people who are, blow, you know, just uh, howling in the wind or something. But 
but then they came to capture the foreign policy initiative of, the, of much of the United States of America with their view of things. Think, Isn't that true? Anyway, do, we, they, do their views still hold, or yeah, what do you think? I don't think their views hold at all. We, okay. we, we really no, dispute but, that. But they were very influential, they were very influential in the influential. mind of Mr. And the, President and, Bush. And the views are very influential among Republicans. Then. Yeah, among Bush. And Bush among seemed to pick up on Bush it and everything like, like that. I think it was disastrous. It was a disaster, I know. Yeah. And anyway, so yeah. uh, going on. Uh, now, the reason why he wrote this letter was because he plagiarized from us. Uh -huh. In our first newsletter, we, 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 we showed that uh, there was no such thing as an oil weapon. Uh -huh. In fact, they couldn't keep the oil, price of oil up in real terms. Uh -huh. So Doug Feith wrote an article for Policy Review uh -huh. in the summer of 81. Major journal, yeah. Called uh, The Oil Weapon Demystified. No, it's the summer of 80. Called The Oil Weapon Demystified. Right. And he uh -huh. basically plagiarized from us. And Richard Coleman says, Doug, I mean, yeah. you know, we asked you for your help. You don't give us any help. But now you plagiarized from us? He took it for an article of his own? An article of his own. Uh -huh. and, then, and then he said, OK, I'll write a nice letter for you, and I'll subscribe to, to your yeah. newsletter when I'm on the Now, industry. how did you get, if I may, I'm just curious. You're academic, you're a PhD. How did you get to be involved in, why did you not take a PhD in economics? Why mathematics, and what's the course? What's the course that leads somebody to not only a master's degree in, econ in uh, mathematics, but a, ma a PhD in mathematics? Well, uh, and how does that fit in? My with father put a lot of pressure on me to go into math. He was he sort of admired mathematicians, uh -huh. so I went into math. And then uh, during the early, during the mid seventies, when I saw what was happening to the economy, I became very interested in the economy. But I saw how it was malfunctioning. And, but and you very continued on the track to get the PhD in mathematics. I, I got the PhD in mathematics in 67. You were young. I was young. I was 25. I, I think mathematics is a thing of the young. I mean, it, it is, is new is mathematics. It is a thing of the young. They had right. a guy from India that said a big tone. He was just a youngster. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah though, I, I know the one with Harding. Yeah, day, yes, yeah, 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 Harding. There was a, but it's a thing of the youth. Uh, Ramanujan? Ramanujan. I, it might be. Ramanujan, I don't remember yeah, the exact. Uh, yeah, and he was a genius. And that happens among the young and everything. But then you, so you got, did you read much economics? I mean, you know. Oh, I read economics, Samuels yes, I, on my own, I read economics. Yeah, and you got interested in And I got in interested that. in it, and I read it, I read it on my own. What do you do in economics to get a PhD? What was your dissertation? How, how do, it, it's so. Uh, I didn't get a PhD uh, in economics, I got a PhD in math. You, I, I'm sorry, I, did, I, math, I, I misspoke, I misspoke. Okay, I said, in get math, a, what does one do to get a PhD in math? To get a PhD in math, I wrote a dissertation. You have to write a dissertation yeah, on exactly. a new topic. Uh -huh. So what I did was I, 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 I disproved a very long-standing conjecture in, in recur, what's called recursive function theory, uh -huh. which is the theory of problems that are unsolvable by computer. Uh, problems that are that not. That are unsolvable by computer. Are not. Are Jesus. not solvable by computer. Are there many problems that are oh, not solvable? Oh, there are a whole, a whole galaxy of problems. Why would would something not be solvable by a computer, uh, it's, and it's, what would it be solvable by? It's not solvable. It's yeah, not I know you're saying not it's not, computer. but I'm, I'm just Well, it's it. not solvable by a computer because uh, it's, it's, it's a theory by Kurt Gödel's theory. Okay. You know, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's rather technical. So you okay. It's rather technical. But it is important. Mathematics, it seems like uh, the algorithms and the things that undergird the communications and the internet and everything seems to be mathematical. It's mathematical. Anyway, I want to go on to my cousin, Chef. All right, okay, cousin. Okay, prior to the creation of the state of Israel, two mm -hmm. Jewish terrorist groups were working to cleanse Palestine of its Arab inheritance and its British occupiers. The more brutal of these groups was Lehu, Lahami Herut Yisrael, fighters for the freedom of Israel, also known as Lehi, or the Stern Gang, after its founder, Avram Stern. Much of its financial support for these Jewish terrorists came from the United States. The Stern Gang money collected under the more perfidious name, American Friends of the Fighters for the Freedom of Israel. Uh -huh. Mr. Shepard Rifkin was the executive director after the UN partition power Palestine and prior to the creation of Israel on May 48th. Against his better judgment, Shepard Rifkin solicited Albert Einstein to help the Stern Gang raise American money for arms to drive out the Arabs and help create a Jewish state. On Arab 10th, the day after the infamous massacre of Arabs at DSC, Einstein replied calling the Stern Gang terrorists misled criminals. Einstein's single page letter on his embossed stationery, and here it is. I'm with, that's the letter, and that's the letter. we had said, Fred, you could bring it up. This is a, I'm going to give you time to focus on it and so forth. And this is Albert Einstein in 19, what's it, 48? It's 46. 1948. 1948. 48, yeah. He wrote a letter about that uh, disallowing uh, the idea, you know, that it was a terrorist organization. And um, the Stern Gang, it would have been one, they had the Ergun. 
Well, what, what they had the, the Argun, one, they had the Argun, and the Stern Gang. And those were two. Those were the two terrorist groups. And the more brutal of those was the Stern Gang. And, the, yeah. and they both participated in the King David Hotel blowing up right. and in the Deir Yassin massacre. So they would be like shock troopers shock of a troopers, thing that yeah. was coming in. And does that happen when you have a, 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 a qualitative change like was going on in Israel, or what was to be Israel at that time? You do have people... Uh, or I'm just thinking where else, where, because I know one of the themes you write on, oh, here's the letter now, they've got it, so you well, can see. They've got it, so you can see the letter. Yeah, come in tight, you can see it's signed by... Uh, I'll read I'll, it, I'll read it. Anyway. Yeah, okay, read it. When a real and final catastrophe should befall us in Palestine, the first responsible for it would be the British, and the second responsible for it would be the terrorist organizations built up from our own ranks. I am not willing to see anybody associated with this misled and criminal people. Sincerely yours, Albert Einstein. Anyway, yeah, uh, okay, that that's that's it. But so, um, they have people like uh, when we were conquering uh, the uh, Indian nations of uh, the Western Hemisphere and so forth. You would have people out there doing very nasty things. Yeah, very nasty things. Shock, shock troop, troops, like yeah. that kind of thing. When a strong power, and that's the theme you write on a lot yeah, now a lot. about the importance of the third of the developing the world, developing world, more important than they think, because most people tend to think whoever's got the weapons and yeah, the, over the, weapons, over yeah. the, the overwhelming power can just overwhelm yeah. other people, and they're in a certain sense above the law. Because they're what the Samir Amin calls the periphery, uh -huh. and the periphery is more flexible and uh -huh. more able to develop and pa and, and ob overcome obstacles. Uh -huh. Okay, anyway, after on, on 4-17-12, I got an email from Lenny Brenner. Uh, he said, Lenny can, Brenner, yeah. Can you send me whatever Rifkin sent Einstein? Uh -huh. And I said I was unable to come up with anything. I, I sent an email to, to Lenny Brenner. Uh -huh. I was unable to come up with anything about Rifkin's letter to Einstein. This is not surprising since our family suppressed all information about Rifkin's Stern Gang past. He was simply portrayed as a heroic Paul Newman-like figure who smuggled Jews on the SS Ben Hecht into Palestine. Now, who's Rifkin? Rifkin is my cousin. Shepard Rifkin. Your cousin. He was my cousin. He was the one that Einstein sent the letter to. Oh, I see. I see. I see. That's what, that's that. Right. Shepard Rifkin, and uh -huh. he was, and my our family. My mother just said he was a heroic, like Ari Ben Kanan in yeah. Exodus. He was like somebody out of Exodus. He smuggled Jews into Palestine yes. on the SS Ben Hecht. When and you're having a thing like the American Revolution, there were people, there were precursors. There were things. People will take a, a um, you know, a lead in terms of starting something radical. Because the right. revolution is something radical. It's not it's your normal radical, right, uh, right. movement and everything. And certainly the establishment of Israel was one thing that was very radical and so forth. You're in touch with Lenny Brenner. You're in touch with Danny I'm in touch with Lenny Brenner. Dan I'm, Danny I'm in touch with Danny Schechter. Yeah. Danny Schechter. You're in touch with some pretty good people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. By the way, would you, would you ever have Norman Finkelstein on the show? I haven't. I'd love to if yeah, I could. Yeah, it It's never him. worked. I don't know it's where he hangs his hat. Is he in Cambridge or what? Oh, uh, I really have no idea where, where he is. I have no idea yeah. where he is. I'd like to. You know, I'd, I'd like to. I met him in, in, in 82. In, you did? In a, in a group called the Jews Against the Israeli Massacre in Lebanon. Uh-huh. Okay. And but I you're not on a regular basis. Uh, no, I'm not on a regular no, basis. No, but it's not. It, it, are there very many people that are radically inclined along that line? Well, I just said a little line in, uh, I'm thinking out of my, the top of my head, because I tell you, know, I like Fuller and, and yeah, I Fuller think and comprehensively so and all that sort of thing. But I think that uh, the world is very much threatened by the by the horrendous um, destructive capability, the weapons that have evolved in the in terms of the human experience in a new and kind of yeah, different a new way, way, yeah, a new way in this time and everything. But it seems to me the most dangerous place in the world uh, to set off something that might set off the weapons of destruction that do exist, the da most dangerous place in the world is Israel. Oh, it is. It, is it does seem that way it to you. Seem. Well, you know, actually, prior to the 82 invasion of Lebanon, uh -huh. I, I mean, I didn't have a bad opinion of Israel. After uh -huh. all, Begin had made peace with Sadat. He gave yeah. back to Sinai. Uh -huh. He made a treaty with the PLO, a peace mm -hmm. treaty, mm -hmm. which held for a year. And it's the first, this is the first, um, he actually quasi recognized. Was that it. around 89, 90? This was in 81. 81. In June oh, of 81, okay. he negotiated. A, they had been bombing, they had been shelling across the Lebanese border. Yeah. They'd been shelling across the Lebanese yeah, yeah, border. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they had this peace treaty in uh -huh. 81. Uh -huh. And Begin signed this peace agreement with Arafat. Mm -hmm. And it held for a year. Mm -hmm. And then Israel invades Lebanon for no pretext whatsoever, for no yeah. reason. In other words, what happened was that the Israeli ambassador to uh, England was wounded 
by an anti-PLO faction, Abu Nidal. Abu Nidal, and Abu yeah, Nidal yeah, an yeah. anti-PLO faction. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And for that reason, Israel decides to invade Lebanon to destroy the PLO. I mean, as I said to the PLO yeah. after the UN, Riyadh Mansour, yeah. uh, if a kid threw a rock across the border, uh -huh. Israel would have more reason to invade. Right, right. Anyway. So was, what was really behind it then? The if really they, behind the invasion is they... What happened is that after the, you know, because of the oil price rise, because of the necessity of Western OPEC cooperation, the, the, the status of the PLO was enhanced. Uh -huh. So they had a greater status, and they, and they were seen as more capable and more uh, trustworthy negotiating partners. And Begin didn't want to be pressured into negotiating with them because he didn't want to give away land. Uh -huh. So he invaded to destroy them. So you were, you were uh, brought up Jewish, right? I was brought up Jewish. And what was your idea? You're, you've got some years, you know, and everything. What was your thought about uh, when, when, when it was getting established at the beginning, 48 and all that? Oh, I don't remember when it was. You I, can't I, I go was back young. that far. It wasn't well, in the family. I was six years old when I was in okay, 48. So, yeah, right. But my mother was very pro-Israel yeah. because of her cousin. And the family Griffin. and everything. And the and family and my father. And that yeah. horrible treatment of the Jewish people in Eastern Europe. And I remember in 56 so when, um, you know, during the Suez crisis, my uh -huh. mother was in love with Abba Iban. She was uh -huh. always so well spoken. He's uh -huh. such king's English. Yeah, yeah, my father, was. Said, was, my father yeah. says, I'll write already with Abba Iban. <laughs> oh, said, what? My father said, I'll write already with Abba Iban. You're yeah. getting me jealous already. Uh, uh, yeah, right, right, right. Anyway, yeah. uh, so, but, and, you know, also I was talking to a Palestinian in, yeah. in, in, in the summer of 2001. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a Palestinian woman, and she said the occupation wasn't that bad in 81. Mm -hmm. Um, in other words, they had their own local governments. Mm -hmm. They had visitation rights in Jordan. They had employment rights in Israel. The economy wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they had this dream of a Palestinian state, uh -huh. and they thought the PLO would get them the Palestinian state. Yeah. But it was like a distant dream. Uh -huh. it, they didn't really, you know, hold to it too closely. But it was, what she said, it was after the uh, massacre at Sabra and Shatila yeah. that the Palestinians yeah. decided they had to take their destiny into their own hands. Or try to. Or try to. So uh -huh. it was the, in essence, it was the Palestine, it was the massacre at Sabra and Shatila, uh -huh. which led directly to the first intifada of 88. Okay, when they did that in 48, they divided it up, but there was always the thing, there are maps that talk about the greater Israel. There are maps that go to Ur. To Ur, right, You right. know, there are, and Where's certainly the West Bank and that. that. And do you think there was in the, what we call Likud, or in, in, in Zionist circles, there was never any intention of having a, uh, a viable Palestinian state at all. It was rather more like they were the attitude of the frontiersmen against, let's say, the Sioux Nation or something along yeah, those lines. Yeah, yeah, that's what The it was. power structure was so in that uh, yeah. they, they never had the intention of having a viable Palestinian state uh, right from the get-go, certainly in the Likud, but maybe in Israel no, no, in they general. Never had the intention I mean, they're, and they're just expanding all Einstein over had visions of a binational state where both sides were equal. Were, were the people... But Lenny Brenner calls that naive. Uh-huh, yeah. You had uh, Jabotinsky coming and, you know, that kind of stuff and revisionism and everything. But um, I, the, it seems to me that the situation now is one of such inordinate power. Inordinate they power. Can lay, uh, they can put unlimited amounts of money, F-16s, Apache helicopters, everything can be given to Israel, so supposedly, uh, you know, uh, $3 billion a year in support. They give them in unlimited support. They get a lot from the private sector. Support, 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 military and everything else, but nothing, not even food and rice can be brought into the people in Gaza. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's a little bit absurd to absurd. think that there is anything other than an inordinate balance yeah. of power difference between the people, the Palestinians, and the Israelis. And the Israelis have, in a certain sense, won. Won, yeah. Like, anyway. we won over the Sioux Nation. Yeah, anyway, also, also as I was going on, to, to go on, um, in the spring of, of 82, I joined the Arab American University graduates okay. and the Palestine Aid Society, okay. not be, for political reasons, because uh -huh. I wasn't politicized then, uh -huh. and I didn't have that bad an opinion of Israel, but I wanted to make business contacts. Okay. I yeah. mean, I wanted, since the two principals of the Cambridge Forecast Group were Jewish, uh -huh. I wanted Arabs in the Cambridge Forecast Group to show that we were objective. And that, the that, that, that partnership was the thing that gave uh, advice to uh, business. The businesses, right, right. Okay, right. so and that's what And the interesting thing is, when I, was at, at, when I was at this Palestine Aid Society meeting, I was the only non-Arab there. Uh -huh. I was there. There's one Iranian fellow, but uh -huh. I was the only non-Arab there. Uh -huh. After the 82 invasion, when those meetings took place, half the people in the room were Jewish. Uh-huh. 
There was an enormous number of Jewish people coming out in support of the Palestinians during that. It's never been reported. It's never really been reported uh -huh. how many, how much sympathy they got among young Jewish people. Uh -huh. Because half the people in those Palestine Aid Society meetings were Jewish. Uh -huh. And anyway, in late, uh, in late, um, were, they, were they like you, a uh, business interest? It was no, no, they were kind of lefties. They were kind they were of liberal, lefties. kind of liberal lefties, as a lot of young Jews are. Did you get more and more of, of a liberal persuasion vis-a-vis -vis, uh, some uh, acceptance of the cause of the Palestinian people? Oh yeah, yeah. People? In '82, you became definitely. radicalized. I became of, radicalized in '82. Uh -huh, absolutely. Uh -huh. And anyway, uh, but you kept your business interests. And stuff I kept my business interests. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, in in late June of '82, after yeah. the invasion, I think the invasion was June 6. I'm not sure exactly when yeah, it was. Yeah, I don't either. Remember. In late yeah. June of '82, um, what was I going to say? Uh, I got a call from a, a woman named Nabiha uh, Nuha Abwa, a woman from the Arab American Unigra Arab American Unigra University graduates who, who I'd known, uh -huh. and uh, they wanted to get as many Jewish people as they can, as they could, to demonstrate against the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. So they wanted me to come there with a yarmulke and uh, show that I was Jewish and mm -hmm. demonstrate. And so I went there with you know I got I got Iabaka out of my out of my drawer, yeah. and I went there. And as I said before, I, t I told you before, I was interviewed by a Greek journalist who said, if it's all, is it all right for a Jew to be demonstrating? Yeah. And that's work. I mean, yeah. demonstrating is work on, on the, the Sabbath. Sabbath. Yeah. I said to the quote a famous Jewish Palestinian, "Is it wrong to do good on the Sabbath?" Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that yeah. was to Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Jewish yeah, 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 yeah. So you hadn't been politically. You became more politically inclined in that kind of thing by the events that were unfolding. Yeah, by yeah. the events, right? Yeah. Okay. And. Um, so okay, so uh, all of that, and then the, and that letter about the Stern. I'm just thinking about those kind of groups, the Stern gang. I had the first program I ever did was I didn't know it at the but time. Yeah, you told me. Yeah. yeah, the guy was a member of the Stern gang, and there, that there, you you have shock troops or something that do that kind of thing. And your one of your themes, your all of this, the book, and the the theme that you're undergirding is the importance of the. In if we look ahead, forecasting and so forth, the importance of the, uh, of the developing, developing world is far more important than they're giving uh, the, credence uh, to giving in credence terms to. of the economic development that the in planet In terms of the needs. economic development, right. Is that, that's a major theme. That's you a have major theme. That's, the book, right. that's a major theme. That that's they really pay attention only to those who are already rich and established. Yeah, only those who are rich and established, yeah. I, that's it. And they, that, that's uh, some of your fellow forecasters and so forth. Uh, do you feel that theme is being understood, the emerging market? if you call it or whatever or those areas that ought to be are they paying more attention to them or are they be over? I saw some people on television the other day one guy said what about Africa he said it doesn't matter you know the, it what matters I think is, it, is the power I think structure it's unrealistic of the gun. to say that Africa doesn't matter Africa has potential yeah 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 I'm not again I'm not an expert on Africa so no no not that the developing world or the, the emerging world general, markets the right? emerging markets have the uh, brick the Brazil the Russia brick, India China do you think they could actually be a threat I mean a, a, a challenge to the, what, the power of the United States and they're what the Marxists would call running dog allies, yeah, which I, is most all of the world. They could be. Yeah, they could be. They I, I could. Like possible. It's possible. Uh -huh. See how things go. What I mean. do you think about what's going on in Iran now? Or the threats again? The uh, oh. What did you think, if I may, I remember that uh, Israel bombed a atomic energy generating in, in, plant in, Iraq in Syria. And in Syria. And in Syria. With impunity. With apparently. impunity, right. With impunity. And that was, are you familiar with that at all? Did yeah, you oh yeah, the bombing of the. Uh, was that, can you tell us, was that, uh, what is there, doing a preemptive strike? They were doing a preemptive strike on the Tokamok a, reactor in Iraq. Right, and it was a energy producing. Uh, reactor. Well, yeah, yeah. They're going to claim that they can't do that kind of thing because they might become a threat to Israel. Yeah, Jean Kirkpatrick said, by the way, that was a disgrace when it happened. She did. No, but what do you, what is you, what do you know about it, and what do you think about the fact that they were able to do that, or the idea of preventive attacks on countries that might be a threat to Israel, that they have a complete right to do that. We go and bomb and we, we invaded Iraq, we invaded Afghanistan, Afghanistan, we put troops all over, and they seem to think it's perfectly all right to unload F-16s, Apache helicopters on the docks of uh, Israel, and just build that up, and that they're legitimate, 
and we're legitimate, and there are these illegitimate uh, axes of evil and so forth that we have every right to go and yeah, attack. Go, go and attack. What do you think about that general view of things? And do you think the BRIC countries or some of the developing, or that the uh, the economics, the real uh, economics of the world, could begin to question the authority? Not only that, but the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and the other, you know, vehicles of power in the Western model that is thought of as they they sometimes say the international community says this, but what they're talking about is a small group of the, international, small group of the community. international community. Yeah. Talk to all of those, because I think that's part of what you yeah, are doing, saying, getting at yeah, with your work. Yeah, the BRICs are definitely becoming more important. Uh -huh. they're, they're going to be more important than the International Monetary Fund. Uh -huh. They are. Uh, and, you know, China is bailing out Europe now. Uh -huh. I mean, they, uh -huh. well, China, Europe wants China to bail it out. Uh -huh. So China is obviously more important as a financial power. So why do you think it is uh, a realpolitik? When you hear that term, I, you're, you've become political after being mathematical and, being being mathematical economic, and, have, and being political and having something. When you hear the term realpolitik, what do you think? Or when you deal with it, that what matters is whoever, or somebody said, was it Gandhi? Or no, it was Mao who said that. No, I, I think that. Power comes out of the end of a gun. Who's ever got the weapon? Who's ever got the, the power weapons. to conquer? Win, and they that's the history of the world. I think, yeah, that's that's about it. And so that that's means if you it. say, if you're talking about the developed or the third world or the emerging markets as having real political power, ability to influence things, that would run against the grain of history. I think there's also, always whoever's got the weapons, but can it's conquer. also there's also uh, economic power, I yeah, guess, economic, well. and then there's soft power. And, and, and China's getting military power now. I don't know about Brazil and Russia, they're building an aircraft, they're building an aircraft, carrier, so yeah, they're yeah. getting military power. Power. So what your theme of the book is along those lines, it's the importance those lines. of the emerging markets. Is there many people who are seeing things the way you do in terms well, of think, the political uh, class that informs our media and so uh, forth, or what? Let's see. I think, uh, I think, what's his name? Rostow. Eugene Rostow saw it that way. Milton Friedman saw it that way. Uh-huh. Milton well, Friedman and Eugene Rostow saw the importance of the developing countries. Yeah, and that's one aspect. And also, there was a guy called Barton Biggs. Barton Biggs, he was yeah, he was a writer. He he was he was a major guy. Uh, and Morgan Stanley. Uh, was he at? Uh, Morgan Stanley. He was Barton at Morgan Stanley. Barton Biggs. Yeah, yeah he was a major him. voice. Well, we, well, we had an interview cannot. with him, uh, but but. Uh, no, but he, he was, was a major in, voice. In Barron's, he was being interviewed, and he said that. Uh, you know, the, the, the small Asian countries like Korea and Taiwan are going great guns, but pretty soon the you know, countries like Brazil and India uh, with large internal markets will be able to just grow under their own, without, without not be dependent on exports, be able to grow under their own steam uh -huh. in terms of market power. Okay. And so the interviewer said it's more complicated than that, and Barton Biggs said, got a dream, got a dream. What does that mean? I don't, I don't know. He said oh, he, he, got a, he got a dream of how good it can be. Dream of, and he was right. Uh -huh. It turns out he was right. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Are you optimistic for the human prospect? Yes, I'm optimistic. You are? Yeah, absolutely. Always have been, never quite. Always, I always, well, I don't know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, obviously not. 62. And 62, I was. You can remember that. Can you remember. were old enough to remember. Oh, yeah, I was, uh, I was in junior. I, you were my, in what? My junior year in college. And you were at MIT? I was, I was 20 years old and, and, and at I, MIT, and that yeah. was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh -huh. I remember I was furious at Kennedy at the time. You were furious? Furious at Kennedy for not simply immediately trading away the Jupiter missiles in Turkey. Do you, yeah. Okay. That that was one. That was part of the overall context, wasn't it? Yeah. I, do, you, do you remember being as I remember very well? Older, but I remember very well. I was just scared. Oh, out, I was scared to death. My wits. I was scared to they death. They came within a hair's breadth of within destroying breath, huh? civilization. Yeah. Yeah. I was scared to death. I remember at the time. Were you aware in any kind of special way, uh, being at MIT or being in academia, of how? destructive the weapons had become by 1962 after Big Boy and all that. You yeah, know. Yeah, I, were yeah. You, yeah. Were you in any way privy to understanding the real, uh, uh, the total destructive capability that existed on those missiles and so forth and delivery systems of thermonuclear weapons after 1954? Mm -hmm. Have you ever looked into that, just how destructive they are? Uh, not, not really. I'm, I'm not really not an expert. Not in any kind of way. I'm not really an expert in, in nuclear weapons. But they came very close to unleashing them. It was, it, do you think it was Khrushchev who backed down? I think it was Khrushchev who backed down. Thank yeah. God. Thank God. He, he had the sense to back down. He was saying to Russia, so he had the sense to back down. But that was really, that, I don't know, the young people watching wouldn't know that, but that was really, um, 
How destructive do you think, maybe as a citizen, rather than thinking as an expert or anything like that, we have the ability to extend our consciousness into technology and tools, yeah. and one aspect of it is the destructive weapons. The weapons, yeah, the destructive power. Hasn't that led the research? Yeah, that's led to research. Uh, you have some sense of history. Has it always led the research? Uh, uh, the political class would finance and peer review and all that sort of thing. People that are developing weapon systems that give the political class du jour an advantage in terms of military capability to coerce or condemn or maybe even just even at co-op. Uh, others and make them so their tribe strong against the uh, wishes of others, and that's called real, re, real re, politics. It's called that. It's called real politics. You think uh, in those terms. Yeah. Some people say, well, that's just you got to be realistic. You can't be idealistically strung out on some idea that isn't realistic to what the reality is. But Haushofer and some of the people in Germany, they call it real politics. Yeah, real politics. And that is that whoever's got the gun can be above the law. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right, right. Right, yeah. And, and that the weapons became, according to a lot of modeling, do you think? I wonder what you think, maybe as a citizen. Yeah. Well, not you know, with Netanyahu says, he oh. who dares wins. That's what Netanyahu says. Well, that's a very dangerous yeah, thing. That was just recently now. Yeah, yeah just recently. He's and they he think that they wins. have the ability to bomb them who might be a threat to might them. Might be a threat. And, so that, and this idea of dual use and the idea you have, a, a, you have an industrial capability, you might turn that industrial capability, maybe you're making automobiles and baby carriages, you could turn it into making weapons and you might become a threat to us, so we're going to bomb your steel factory. Yeah, right. That kind of Thinking, yeah, that kind of thing is, is parano That's why I think Israel is the most dangerous. Country I think it is. I think you right. do think. That. I think so. I think it's dangerous. Have you always thought? Have you thought? No, that no, for no, a no. Prior to the invasion of Lebanon, uh, Lebanon is what my, made my, it my, my view of Israel was pretty much neutral. And is I that mean, because they have such a strong national attachment to the land there, and also had suffered so mightily under the, yeah, uh, under, Nazi, under the Nazis, Bologna, yeah. and all of that, that makes them so very, very. What would be the word? Well, paranoid. When I saw Ibrahim Koja, mm. the Saudi commercial at the he said, uh, "He said Hitler, uh, Hitler was crazy, but then what he did made the Jews crazy. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Hitler was crazy." Well, yeah, but what I'm saying, what do you think of all that? And then I want to bring it around full tilt with you. Are you having some understanding of things? I know you're, um, you're not. It's not your bailiwick and everything. But there are modelings that say that the weapons became. I don't know how many thousands, tens of thousands of weapons. We were apparently in 1962. Uh, there would have been some survivors there if there was an all-out. And what we're looking at is what what would possibly uh, no that the weapons in their capability, in the capability of the destructive capability that's just growing so powerful yeah, growing in the so modern powerful. experience, uh, you know, way beyond gunpowder or tanks or whatever, but that they became in their capability, if they were to be unleashed in a spasm of obviously irrational hatred or something, uh, that if they, they have particularly things, germ things that are developed, yeah, uh, secret germ. weapons that are developed that aren't known even to the general even public or even the political, much of the political class. Know, but the weapons, if they were to be unleashed, uh, could be, they've reached a point where they could eliminate the entire homo sapiens yeah, even species. Have, especially with nuclear Have you ever earth. thought on that? Well, I haven't thought about no. it too much. Oh, I didn't, maybe I shouldn't bother bringing no, it No, no, I haven't thought about it too much. So I don't okay, remember. most of the modeling seems to show we didn't get to that point until about 1970. About 1970, yeah. And that's against 200,000 years of our existence. Anyway. Um, no, but if we did, don't you think that would be an existential new reality? That would be an term? existential new reality, definitely. It would be. It would definitely. be worth taking into account. It would be worth taking into account, right. Okay. I just bring it up because wow. uh, that's where the danger of something like that would be, uh, let's lob a couple of uh, weapons uh, nuclear tipped into Iran. Into Iran, yeah. And then the Americans, what would, it would cause, something that would cause the Americans to unleash the weapons that are under their control. Yeah, yeah. Can you see any scenario where that could be done? Because that's the only place 
that would be able to be dealing with things at a species level. It's hard to imagine. It really is hard, it to, is hard, to, it is hard to imagine. You find it hard to imagine? I find it hard to imagine. If Israel did, some general, some strange lover, somebody said, no Holocaust, Hitler, you know, some sort of a thing, they're an existential threat. We the hear Samson, it every day, don't the we? The Samson option. The Samson option. No, we hear it every day coming yeah. out of Israel now as we're talking. Well, during the 73 war, Diane issued a nuclear threat. Okay, yeah, but I'm talking now. This is 1912, 2012. And we're hearing it all the time that we'd better go and bomb Iran yeah. because Iran is not bowing down to us. They're supporting Hezbollah. They're this and that. But otherwise, they're, and they quote him Ottoman in agenda and so forth uh, as saying that they want to obliterate Iran. He's just said they don't think Israel can live as it is as an apartheid state. An apartheid Israel's state. setting themselves up as an apartheid, as an apartheid state, state, a right. conquering thing, a conquering and they thing. want to be able to have, and they've got unlimited power in their view, and there are even people who are ready to thumb their nose at any kind of veto that the United States might want to put on their lashing out yeah, against lashing that out. country. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the most imp diff diff uh, threatening? It is the most threatening thing, whether it's Israel and Iran. It's the most okay. threatening thing. And in the it world. could drag us in. And it could drag and us in. Why do we support them? Why do we support that well, country we so this fervently and completely? And every single political leader will bow down to APEC. I think it's and APEC is probably the most important yes, and the, powerful lobby in Washington. It's the influence of the, of the why? Of the, of the, of the, why? Of, what is in our interest? To you know, be so a lot of a lot of, of a lot of the Democratic national funding comes from Jewish sources. Of course. Okay. Yeah. And then there's APEC, and then the power of the Israeli lobby. Yeah. Why? And then why? No, why is the and then there's the Holocaust. Well, you know, okay. sympathy for the Holocaust. And then finally, I think and most importantly, there's the fact that Israel is a Western, advanced, rich country, okay. and, the Pal and it's first world, and the Palestinians are poor, and the third world. And the part of your book is about the importance uh, of the uh, third world. world. So well, we don't care about the poor. We don't care about the poor. Is that, is that, is that that's part of your thinking? I'm thinking so that's that we, we like, don't care um, about the poor. Always right. the leadership of anything, I don't think the... Israel's in the rich man's club, yeah. and the Palestinians are not in the rich man's club. Is that why we support them? And we sympathize with them, I think, largely... Because they're one of us winners. One of us winners. We've right. got that. It's sort of like the Occupy Wall Street Occupy might be Wall Street. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That kind, that's what I'm trying to get yeah, at. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But where is it most dangerous that could set off the weapons? I can't think of anything other than chauvinistic and uh, absolutely paranoid um, uh, Jewish leadership of the country of Israel. Of Israel, yeah. What I do mean, you I, think? I don't think, for example, the... Uh, the China Taiwan thing is, is it all dangerous? No, 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 Matsu. Remember the two islands? Yeah, the Kiwai Matsu yeah, with yeah, Nixon. And yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think. No, but that that's the most dangerous. That's the because most dangerous because they yeah. are so militant, and they're right. now building settlements right in Jerusalem. They say we've won. We've won. We've yeah. won. We've won. Bow down. I that's think there are the five hundred thousand right? settlers. The, I yeah. mean, there's no room for a Palestinian state anymore. Right. It's no, that's what I'm saying. So five hundred thousand settlers. So is the analogy that we've won over the the Indian nations of North America, yes, the Europeans, the, 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 same analogy, the same analogy, and bow down, and um, you've lost, uh, and it, that's what they're insisting. Yeah. And now anybody who tries to make common cause, Balah, or anything like that, Nasrallah, and that kind of thing, they've now we got the is the Jew, the uh, Arab, the Arab or the Islamic is the enemy du jour. It used to be communism. And now it's just Islam. Now, communism now it's has, Islam. It's yeah, Islam. you do agree with yeah, all I do of agree that. With that. So anyway, the, also uh, okay uh, now. Uh, about the demonstration against the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. When I left the demonstration, yeah. I saw the news that Haig had been replaced by Schultz. Uh -huh. it was more, you know, he got fired because yeah. of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon okay. and replaced by a more pro-Arab and a more pro, uh, a more dovish Schultz. Yeah. Also, I received a call from Japan that our first issue of the Japanese newsletter. Uh, the Cambridge Forecast Group of Japan. Oh, wh was, what are you reading from? Now? Is oh, this your writing or something? It's my else? writing. It's my writing. Okay, okay. The Cambridge Forecast Group of Japan was going great guns. Uh -huh. They had sold, a, their first issue had sold, a, gotten a lot of subscribers, uh -huh. unlike the American newsletter. Uh -huh. Okay, so I thought that things wouldn't be that bad that the U.S. would put its foot down. And indeed, after the Sabran Shatila massacre, Reagan became the first president to call for a Palestinian state. Uh, what does that tell us? What's what, uh, is fill it out. No, it, it, your, show, your it shows that Reagan was far more pro third world than people recognize. Okay, that's interesting. And yeah. that you know, although he started out by saying Jordan is Palestine. Yeah, yeah, right. And yeah. in the campaign, he said Jordan is Palestine. Yeah. 
uh, after the Sabra Chachilam asked, I think his eyes were open. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, there should be a Palestinian state, a separate Palestinian state. That's all gone for naught? That's all gone for naught now. It's yeah. all over? It's all over, yeah. So what's going to... Um Okay. Uh, also, he, also, I think he told Israel to step back from the abyss which lies before but it. But they haven't. They've just pushed. Uh, and they've just pushed into it. They haven't. They haven't really stepped back from it at all. Uh huh. And what? Uh, w w okay. That's you're going back to Shatila and it's not 80, Shatila, the and that, you're going back to there. And what about now? And when we look ahead, and what do you? Um, think, uh, is it just up for the Palestinian peoples to just surrender and bow yeah, I down? Think so. I think the they down. have no choice. That's I think they're they, looking at a situation where it's just going to be apartheid. Uh, apartheid. apartheid and even as you said, it is apartheid And now. even if the Palestinians get the vote, as you said, it's going to be economic apartheid. Yeah, yeah. Although I can't really see them getting the vote. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So it's the whole thing. So is it's, it's, it, it's a model uh, like when we conquered uh, Jackson in that, in the history of the United States, there were Indian nations here, or the there were throughout the Western Hemisphere. Throughout the Western Hemisphere. And they yeah. were either wiped out. Or they were conquered. Oh, they were conquered, right? And they, they, and how? Oh, they, speak, oh, they, oh, they settled like the, the Cherokee who. Oh, uh, uh, Cherokees. Uh, okay, yeah. But I guess what I'm getting at is how is it that in world history evolving? It's evolving all the time and so forth. The big view and everything like that. There are some people who, for reasons that are hard to understand, chance, necessity, inventive, uh, whatever, uh, get ahead if that's the right term, in terms of technology and the extension yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, right, right, exactly. So they become what is called developed. Well, they right? become developed. And then how do people who are developed deal with people who have, until they are found, like in the 18th, 17th, 18th century in that, they were found that they were, they, they, they hardly, they were so undeveloped yeah. that there, there was such a breach between the yeah, two. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. How does that dynamic happen in world history? What happens when a, 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 a culture or a unit of humanity is advanced encounters one that is not That's the so general, advanced. It's generally an exploitative relationship. You think, isn't oh, yeah. it the case? It's it isn't the case, so it becomes an exploitative relationship. It becomes exploitative, yeah. and then... Well, I mean, in the past, you know, back in 2,000 years ago, when there was no mode of well, transit, then they were isolated from each other, sort of. That's what I'm uh, thinking. Right, but, but, but with modern means of communication and transportation, uh -huh. it becomes an exploitative relationship. It was, and uh, you had uh, emperors in Rome, the emperor and in Rome. then you had kings. You had kings in the dynastic states after a thousand years after Rome, and they lived in big castles on the hill with racks of lamb, and the peasants were wandering, oh, yeah. were wallowing around in the mud and yeah. exploited. exploited. Isn't yeah. that more or less the history of the it's world? So world. why shouldn't the Palestinians realize you've lost? Those people that have lost and have been conquered yeah. have to somehow at some point give up the idea that what they represent has any value. They just have to adopt to what their conquerors tell them they have to do. And that's been the history okay, of much line of the with world. That, How do we deal with that yeah, confidence? Yeah. And that's what I think your book yeah, might be about. in concern now, in line with. I'm suggesting. The, I don't know. In line with that, uh -huh. one of the arguments made by the Israeli writers that the Palestinians didn't originate in Palestine, right, that right. they came in. And, and this guy, Ambassador retired, Yoram Ettinger, mm. he writes, most Palestinians are Muslim Arabs who originated in the Arabian Peninsula. However, the source of the name Palestine was Pleshet, the region of the Philistines, Pleshtim in Hebrew, who originated in Greece's Athean Islands. They were expelled from Greece in 1300 B.C., settled the coastal plains of the land of Israel in 1200 B.C. 1300 B.C., in that's 1200 way back. BC. Yeah. The Roman Empire introduced the name Palestina in order to erase the memory of the Jewish people and the Jewish homeland, Judea, from history. Contrary to political correctness, Palestine was never an Arab entity with a unique national geographic and cultural identity. It was part of a larger entity, and its Arab inhabitants considered themselves as part of the Arab, Muslim, Ottoman, or Greater Syrian entity, entities. George Habib Antonius, the leading historian of Arab nationalism, considered Palestine to be parts of the Greater Israel. Most Palestinian Arabs are descendants of the 1845 to 1947 Muslim migrants 
from the Sudan, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, as well as from Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Yemen. And Libya, you're writing this, or you're quoting this? This is, or, this is Joram Ettinger, okay. and Abbas, this is what he wrote. Okay, I don't know who he is. Yeah, he's, he's a, a scholar, is that it? He's a retired uh, uh, ambassador. Okay, really yeah, about. okay, yeah. Uh, Libya, Morocco, Bosnia, the Caucasus, Turkmenistan, Kurdistan, India, Afghanistan, and Baluchistan. Mm -hmm. Arab migrant workers were imported by the Ottoman Empire and by the British Mandate, which defeated the Ottomans in 1917 to work on infrastructure projects. The port of Haifa, the Haifa Quantara, uh, Haifa Quantara, Haifa Edri, Haifa Nablus, and Jerusalem Jaffa railroads, military installations, roads, quarries, reclamation of wetlands, etc. Legal and Ill illegal Arab laborers were also attracted by the relative economic boom stimulated by the Arab annual Jewish immigration beginning in 1882. The Arab population of Haifa surged from 6,000 in 1800 to 80,000 in 1919 as a result of workforce migration, modernization introduced by the British occupation and establishment and expansion of Jewish settlements, which enhanced the infrastructure and employment rate. The, infra the, the eruption of World War II accelerated the demand for manpower and the flow of migrants to the area west of the Jordan River. According to a 1937 report by the British Peel Commission, Palestine betrayed Professor Ephraim Karsh, Yale University Press, 2010, page 12. Quote, the increase in Arab populations most marked in urban areas affected by Jewish development. A comparison of the census returns in 1922 and 1931, excuse me, in 1922 and 1931, shows that six years ago, the increased percent in Haifa was 86, in Jaffa 62, in Jerusalem 37, while in purely Arab towns such as Nablus and Hebron, it was only seven, and in Gaza there was a decrease of 2%. As a result of the substantial in 1880 to 1947 Arab immigration, and despite Arab immigration caused by domestic chaos and inter-Arab violence, the Arab uh, population of Jaffa, Haifa, and Ramla grew 17, 12, and five times, respectively. The 1830 to 1840 conquest by Egypt's Muhammad Ali was solidified by a flow of Egyptian and Sudanese residents settling empty spaces between Gaza and Turkaram in the Hula Valley. They followed the footsteps of thousands of Egyptian draft dodgers who fled Egypt before 1831 and settled in Acre. The British traveler H.P. Tristan identified in his 1861 The Land of Israel, a journal of Palestine and travels, Egyptian migrants, migrants in the Beit Shein Valley, Accra, Hadera, Netanyahu, and Yaffa. The British Palestine Exploration Fund documented that Egyptian neighborhoods proliferated in the Jaffa area, Sagnat al Musariya, Abu Khabir, Abu Dirwish, Sumail, Sheikh Mouanis, Salama Fedja. In 1917, the Arabs of Jaffa represented at least 25% na nationalities, including Persian, Afghanis, Hindis, and Baluchis. Hundreds of Egyptian families settled in Ara, Arara, Kafr, Qasim, Taibi, Liba, Kuala Sanya. In 1908, Yemenite Arab migrants settled in Jaffa, and Arabs from Syria's Haran province proliferated in the ports of Jaffa and Haifa. That's a lot of data. What's the pattern? The what's pattern the, is what's the, the pattern? What this guy Ettinger is claiming yeah. is that the Palestinians really didn't come from Palestine originally, that they really migrated from elsewhere. Uh -huh. And I don't know, if you must have heard of, of, of Joan Peters. No. Anyway, uh, Joan Peters wrote a book, I'll have it here. Joan Peters wrote a book called From Time Immemorial when she would try to prove that the uh, Palestinians didn't really originate in Palestine and therefore it was okay to expel them. Uh -huh. And Norman Finkelstein debunked it. Uh -huh. So yeah. she was using the arguments of Ettinger, basically. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that's the thing. And then, uh, yeah, it's Shlomo Sand, his program would have aired the day before ours, looks at the Jewish. And he looks at the Jewish people and their claim to uh, uh, back to, you know, the time of Solomon and questions that in, in scientific terms and so so they have all these claims, but it's really part of geopolitical uh, uh, power. Yeah, right, 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 of course. Of course. And um, so what do, you, what do you think is going to, what do you think, um, from your understanding, as you watch the news and everything now, is, is it a dust-up that's not going to come to anything over the current thing of the Israeli Netanyahu government and so forth? Um, ginning up, as they say, for an attack upon Iran. 
They look like they're drilling up for an attack upon Iraq. But they do this. You think it's going to come to something? I hope not. I and hope why, not. why would they be... Is there any chance they could go off the reservation? What I'm getting at is they could kick it off. They could yeah. kick off a thing, and then we would have to come in. We're, it's a strange love scenario. It's a strange love scenario. No, right. is there a danger along those I lines? I think there is a danger along those lines. Is it a serious one? It's Up a serious. in your barometer of understanding My barometer, risk? it's a serious danger. Uh-huh. I think so, yeah. It's something we ought to be concerned we with. We ought to be concerned about. And how do they deal with the realities on the ground in terms of uh, Gaza and the West Bank and now Jerusalem and uh, the Palestinian claim and the Arab world? Um, you agree that the enemy du jour of the so-called Western powers is Islam? Islam, yeah, of course. It was communism. It was communism. You read a very nice piece on the Internet, and you had a 10-minute piece about the importance of the fall of the Soviet Union the of the Soviet on world affairs. On world affairs. That's right. Uh, it was the Soviet Union, one and all will remember, that was the enemy du jour, it was the commies. Uh, the commies, right. Right. And that no longer is the case? No, 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 the communists won that. Now what they're ginning Cuba, up. Cuba, I mean, it's North Korea. Uh, yeah, yeah no. a little bit yeah. uh, absurd, right? Yeah. And then you've got this thing in China and so forth, but they're claiming they are foul. Do you know they're claiming they had a guy coming, the new guy, uh, you may be aware of it more than I, they got a new guy coming in, head of China, and his uh, academic area of expertise and all the things that China would be confronted with now and everything like that. But his area of expertise is um, dialectical material oh, and Karl Marx. And Karl they Marx. still claim to be... They still claim to be communists. What do you make of that? It's so openly, to me, absurd. It's, absurd, it's, just, yeah. a, it's just a capitalist It model. legitimizes the political rule. Well, they have political yeah. rule, and they're very, very... And, and, I don't know, thousands of uh, demonstrations try to be demonstrated. You got, uh, I don't know, 500, I don't know, a million, some great numbers of people in Shanghai and whatnot coming up, but you you got a billion people living on a couple dollars a day. They got real problems there, yeah, and they're they got, still trying to claim that, power that, 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 in the name of Karl of Marx. Karl Marx, yeah. What kind of a world do we live in, where that uh, sort of just runaway? Ca it's just a uh, capitalism. It's just runaway capitalism under the name of Karl Marx. Now, what, where, where is there? What is the opposition that can be manifest? Is there any point in giving any hope? To the inequities that exist between the developed and the the the, the rich over the rich over, over the, 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 the poor. Uh, conquering the, the rich poor, and conquering over and the poor. So they have that kind of thing in a large pattern. Part of the thing you're interested in our book is there any hope in any kind of time at this time where the weapons become and remain apparently. I would like to get chapter and verse myself on it. Species lethal. Yeah. I, I mean, think that's an existential new reality, that's an existential and they could be dug, drug into something. And yet we have a, a capability through good design and technology and capability. Uh, we have a capability of taking care of people in a way and feeding people and clothing them and housing them and taking care of them within an ecological context that's equally existentially new in terms of the percentage of the world population that could be seen to be halves by material standards. Equally existential e to yeah, the, yeah, right, And exactly. we don't have a system that allows us to do what we're capable we don't have of a system doing. Of, we don't have a way of distributing We don't have a way of distributing the, the Do you agree with that? I agree with From that. We don't have a way of distributing the world. Now, what is, is there any hope? Where is there any hope? In a world like this, where the political system seems to be all, uh, all you know, not coming to anything, is there any hope in this uh, thing that's trying to be called Occupy Movement? I think there is for the Occupy Movement. Do you think it has any real hope, or is it just another thing where the, uh, the like the Palestinians, they'll be oh, just, I think it has real they'll, hope. they'll be beaten down, or like the, the, kind the of Indian thing nations, they'll be beaten down, or the slaves will be beaten down, and that the rich will rich will the, the run Occupy Wall Street, the Occupy all over Wall the Street. Uh, uh, movement is the kind of thing you need to change the system. You think it has any chance? I hope it does. I you think know, it does. I know. What do you think? I think it does. Uh, what did you think when they went into that park? They called it Liberty Park, and Mr. Bloomberg said he had an army of 33,000 oh. 33, men. What's the name of What's the name of that park again? Perugia or something. Yeah, Perugia I was there. I, I, I was there. I was there with my friend Janice. Yeah, I but remember. he they went and invaded with police. Yeah, he went and invaded. And now with they're going to now they got uh, Bill Two uh, Three Twenty Four. Did you see that? Anybody who's now they're 
we're laying the predicate for an out-and-out -out police state. Can you see that emerging in this country? No, no. The I, I legislation that's passed. I can't see it. I can't. See no, it. you don't see it. I don't. See you it. don't see it developing. I think the they Occupy just, Wall Street movement. Uh, they're they're yeah. they're now saying a thing. Any candidate or any Secret Service man uh, will be protected, and that if you go and protest to them, you'll be able to be put under arrest and put in jail. I didn't know that. No, yeah, no. no, that, no that, what that, I'm that, saying is, and yeah, Obama. Know is signing it into law. That I didn't know. That They're didn't know. very worried because they don't have a system. They think that the system by which, you know, the, 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 the system by which growth has gone on in the past and that that Occupy thing was a little something had no real meaning, we'll just get back to the normal pattern of all the assets being owned by a few and all of that kind of stuff, and everything's fine on planet Earth. Yeah, yeah. But I, I don't, don't think it is. I don't think it is, no. There, do you think the Occupy movement has a chance of really... I I think it has growing and growing and growing I think all it, over the world I think it has a because chance the of world growing. system is not I think adequate. it has a chance of growing and becoming global. You I want to that. encourage that? Oh, sure I want to encourage uh -huh. that. Uh-huh, yeah. Do you think there are very many people that do? You don't see anything in the normal media. You don't see anything in the normal media. You do media. not? No, no. Okay. Anyway, also... Uh, oh, uh, we don't address these issues. Uh, yeah. are they, is it just pointless to try and do it? The rich and powerful will overload and they will conquer and they will just turn everybody into a slave. And it, people will function as best they can. We just have to accept that, or well, I, I'm getting a little bit off uh, base here and everything. Yeah, hopefully, but I are. sense a great sense of urgency uh, uh, for there to be some vision. There has to be some vision. I agree. Okay, where's it coming from? That's a good question. I don't uh, know. What do you think? I don't know. Uh, or I what are the conundrums? Uh, somebody like Samir Amin. I mean, yeah, he's good. No, like he's him. good when it comes to history, but yeah. I think. Uh, He's good when it comes to history, but I, I think he underestimates, underestimates the power of capitalism in the developing world. Uh -huh. I think he underestimates that. Uh -huh. The power of you know the, the BRICS and, and the rise of China, the Chinese capitalism and Brazilian capitalism uh -huh. and Indian capitalism. I think he underestimates that. I also think he's not that knowledgeable in technology. Uh -huh. Technology is very, very important. Very important. So he's very good when it comes to history and economics and social thinking. Yeah, we're but talking about Euro Euro When it comes to technology like nanotechnology, yeah. fusion, and so on, as he himself admitted to me uh, when I asked him a question. Are you in close communication? No, I, I, I asked him a question at yeah, the Social right. Scholars Conference yeah. back uh -huh. in, the, in the 80s. Uh -huh. And he said, I'm not that familiar That's with Samar technology. That's Samar Amin. I think he's in, is he in Senegal Senegal. Now? He's, he's originally Sen Egyptian. Yeah, he's originally a Egyptian. A great scholar. Yeah. A great scholar, right. Yeah. I saw him Euro on the... Eurocentrism, yeah. I know. Someone, someone at my building said I look a little bit like him. You? Well, okay. Yeah, yeah he I was a know. good fellow. That program I did with him years ago, I understand. Yeah. But I just say uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing and everything. And I'm very worried that uh, our leadership doesn't seem to have vision that can be encompassing of the least yeah. among us. Um, the least all the among wisdom us. school, right, the least and when among you're us. talking about those people are more important, they just assume the only people you have to pay any attention to are the ones that are already rich and powerful and have lots of guns. Yeah, right. There you pay attention right. to them, and that's called reality. Also, going back to the, uh, yeah, we only got a couple minutes, so well, get something in quick. Okay? Uh, you know, the demonstrations against Israeli Rachel Levin. I met, I said, I met this very beautiful woman, Carol, there. Oh, Carolyn, I knew. Okay, yeah, I didn't I, know I, you two Carol, were. Uh, yeah, we were boyfriend yeah. and girlfriend from, yeah, two, from 1988 till 2000. Lovely lady. Lovely lady. I'm sorry she passed. And she was the ex-wife of the Jordanian Prime Minister. I didn't know that. Very active in pro-Palestinian politics. Uh -huh. Her, her uh -huh. house was, I think, the, the center for the Union of Arab Federations. Uh-huh. And she was very active in pro-Palestine. As I said, we were boyfriend and girlfriend from 1988 till 2004. Uh -huh. And she died uh, just about a year ago. I know. I'm really sorry. Yeah. I didn't know you were that close. I knew her. And we knew each other. And, uh, she was the one who introduced me to you. Is, is that right? Yeah. I didn't was. realize all the people I've introduced. Happy to have been able to do that. Sorry we're running out of time. Yeah. Lawrence, thanks for all the good work. Sorry I got off on a rant and everything. But I'm very concerned about the, yeah, the of current course, situation of course. and everything. And I thank you and your partner. Look forward to meeting when he gets to town. Yeah, of course. And uh, thank you in the audience for viewing. It's been your pleasure, the per perceptions of Dr. Lawrence uh, Finer, Ph.D., uh, Cambridge, uh, what's it called? Cambridge Forecast Group. Forecast, Forecast, Forecast group, group, and also a Ph.D. in mathematics, but also developed interest in economics and also, in, as you can see, in politics and in the broader world. And they have a blog that's very well recommended, so thanks a lot for that. Okay, fine. And thanks for you. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. Okay. So, um, I... Uh,